Hello. Hi. Uh, welcome everyone to session 16 applications, uh, training and simulations uh, section of the IEEE virtual reality conference. Uh, my name is Craig. I'm the session chair. Uh, I am from George Mason University. And uh, we have five papers in this section. Uh, one, two, yeah, five papers in this section, and each paper will present for about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. And you will, you, you are welcome to ask questions on uh, Slido, and I will pick up the questions uh, and I will ask the authors during the Q and A. So, uh, should, I, should I introduce the first paper? The first. The first paper is titled Automatic Synthesis of Virtual Wheelchair Training Scenarios. Uh, the authors are Wan Wan Ni, Javier Talavera, Amilka Gomez, uh, Samuel, uh, Jay Ming Liang, left Fai, and Left Fai Yu from George Mason University. And I pass the time to the author and uh, presenter is Javier. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Javier Talavera. I am an undergraduate student at George Mason University, here to talk about our work on the automatic synthesis of virtual wheelchair training scenarios. Okay, so there are approximately 2 million new wheelchairs, wheelchair users in the US every year. This can be due to illness, injury, or disability. Being able to navigate well with wheelchair is important for many of the users as it may end up becoming their main method of transportation. Certain maneuvers such as sharp turns or navigating air paths can be difficult and are an important part of learning how to use a wheelchair. Currently, there are three main ways to learn how to use a wheelchair. The first involves the use of a human coach. This generally involves one-on-one -on -one in person guidance from an experienced individual and is known to work well and be an effective form of training. The next method is self-teaching through trial and error. Of the three, this is the least effective. This is followed by instruction by either video tutorial or instruction manual. All these approaches have limitations, such as the time to complete the training, the location of the training, and the availability of when one can receive the training. With the rise of virtual reality, the use of virtual training simulations have proposed effective ways of practicing certain tasks with an element of realism that is not available in a video tutorial or reading of instructions. For example, as shown listed here, virtual reality has been used in training ranging from surgical procedures to driving, industrial maintenance, and even shooting. While there are some simulations that focus on manual wheelchair use, for example, this wheelchair simulator, it lacks realistic mechanics and does not focus on the training aspect of the wheelchair. Our approach attempts to solve some of the problems previously mentioned, such as lack and variability of location. We do this by using automatically generated scenarios, which can be navigated with a, base, a physics based wheelchair simulation. The approach uses a cost based system to generate indoor environments with a specified training path for the user to follow. The main characteristics that we focus on for the path are the length, rotations, and narrowness. The difficulty of the path can be adjusted depending on the user. The costs that are used for generating the training scenarios are the pairwise distance, pairwise rotation, path distance, path rotation, and path narrowness costs. 
there are two pairwise costs specified in the training scenario generation. These costs are focused more on the scene generation. A pairwise cost is a cost of an object relative to the position or orientation to another object. With a distance cost, each object has a specified distance cost used to determine a distance from its pair. This cost allows for a reasonable distancing between pairs. For example, it would be unreasonable to place a couch up against a TV, nor would it be appealing to have a couch too far away from a TV. The pairwise distance cost avoids such scenarios by allowing a target pairwise distance to be specified by the user. So looking at the equation, given the list of object positions as vector v and the pair indices vector e, the pairwise distance cost is denoted here, where given any pair ij, v sub i is the position of object i, and v sub j is the position of object j, and d sub i j is the pre-specified target distance between these pair objects. For the rotation cost, it's similar. An object can specify a certain rotation with respect to its paired object. The orientation of certain object is important for creating a realistic layout. Without this cost term, objects may face in random directions rather than towards their pairs. The pairwise rotation cost is calculated as the difference between relative angles of the paired objects and their expected relative angles. So given the list of angle rotations of objects, denoted as vector theta and the pair indices vector e, the pair rock, uh, pairwise rotation cost denoted here, uh, where given any pair ij, theta sub i is the rotation of object i, and theta sub j is the rotation of object j. And delta sub i j is the target relative angle between object i and j. With the distance cost, a path begins at the wheelchair and ends at the target. The target position is a randomly sampled is randomly sampled during the optimization process. The path is optimized as the furniture attempts to place themselves around the room. The path distance cost, which measures the difference between path distances p and the user specified target distance d path is denoted here. As shown in the right figure, the total distance of a path can be calculated by summing up the distances between every two adjacent nodes in the path p sub i and p sub i plus one. With the rotation cost, the customization of the path rotation is vital for adjusting the simulation difficulty for a user. For example, if a user cannot navigate turns well, adjustments can be made to have the path gradually increase rotations until the user feels comfortable with turning. The path rotation cost measures the difference between the rotation number of the path p and the user specified target rotations, which is denoted on the left. With the rotation Boolean function, gamma sub i of p returns one, when p sub i plus one minus p sub i is not equal to, or is not equal to p sub i minus p sub i minus one. Otherwise, the function will return zero. As shown in the right figure, the rotation number increases only when the adjacent two nodes have different directions. With the narrowness cost, in order to manage the training difficulty with respect to how narrow a path is, narrower paths require more precise control, which mimic training scenarios within a tight virtual space. The path narrowness cost measures the difference between the average narrowness of path P and the user specified path narrowness and subpath, and is denoted where QI, Q sub I is the position of the object in the scene S, which is closest to the path node P sub I on the left side and on the right side, W sub I. For optimization of the room, we used an interactive approach, which attempted to minimize the total cost of the training scenario. For the path, the optimization is specified using three main costs, as previously mentioned. These are the distance of the path, the rotations of the path, and the narrowness. During the optimization, starting from the wheelchair, the A star algorithm, a widely used pathfinding and graph traversing algorithm, is employed to generate a random path in each iteration. Randomly sampled paths are accepted when they are closer to the target path than the previous path until the best path is found given the current synthesized layout of the scene. For the room, each optimization step has three types of move. First, an object moves to a random position. Second, an object will rotate to a random orientation. And third, the path target will move to a random position. 
In our optimization approach, the Metropolis Hastings algorithm is used to find the optimal solution. During each iteration, whether or not to accept a new move is decided by an acceptance probability. This acceptance probability is determined by the total cost of the current status and the proposed status. The total cost uses all the costs specified, bounding the range of the total cost function to the interval zero and one. The acceptance probability function is dependent on the number of iterations. At the start of the optimization, the temperature is set to one, giving the optimizer a higher probability of accepting incorrect moves. As the iterations increase and the temperature decreases, the algorithm becomes more greedy and less likely to accept worse moves than before. When the optimizer reaches its final stage, all bad moves are discouraged and minimized to a probability close to zero. So as you can see at the bottom figure, objects are randomly initialized in the room and it goes through each iteration it begin, and as it begins to find, and it begins to find an optimal solution. So weights are placed on certain costs to prioritize different moves. Moving on to the navigation with the room, the wheelchair simulation is done using HTC Vive trackers attached to the wheels of a manual wheelchair. This allows for precise tracking of the wheels locations and the wheelchair with the trackers attached is raised to keep the wheels off the ground and moving the wheels of the wheelchair moves the virtual wheelchair. So on the right, we calculate the angular speed of both sides of the wheels W of t as a function with respect to time t, where r of t is the radius vector of a wheel defined on the right, and the delta and delta of t is the rotation direction of wheels defined there as well. In our simulation approach, the wheelchair is always facing along the z-axis. Wheelchair movement in the simulation is done by translating and rotating the scene rather than the virtual wheelchair. For example, when the wheelchair seems to move forward in the simulation, it actually remains static while the scene moves past it. So in order to test the efficacy of our training environment, users would be asked to go through a physical course using a manual wheelchair. They were given a predetermined path made up of bottles to follow and the bottles knocked down and time it took to, to complete the course recorded. The procedure was performed both before the training simulation and after for a post evaluation. Each circle on the chart at the bottom or correspond with a bottle in the path. The number associated with color is the number of times that bottle was knocked over. So the, vir uh, the VR training. <clears throat> the virtual training consisted of nine scenarios with varying levels of difficulty, some with more path rotations, longer distances, and narrower paths. Uh, this allowed for the user to practice different maneuvers. Here were the nine scenarios that each user went through. There were three with long paths, three with high rotations, and three with high narrowness. Yeah. So I think it was to make sure that we kept the uh, trackers, I guess. Uh, what's it called? I think, I think that's just how we decided to do the approach in the end. We probably could have ended up doing it with uh, instead of moving the scene, actually moving the, or moving the virtual wheelchair instead. But I think we just decided in the end that was probably the way we we're gonna go. So um, here are the results. This figure shows the bar plot of pre-evaluation, or it, the pre-evaluation is shown in blue and post-evaluation is shown in orange. There were 15 users in total. The figure on the left is the number of bottle collisions and the figure on the right is the time to finish the task for each user. Uh, in order to measure whether the improvement of the user's skill in controlling the wheelchair significantly improved, well, we applied the ANOVA test to compare the pre-evaluation data and post-evaluation data. In our case, factors are time duration and bottle number. Uh, therefore, we applied two separate one-way ANOVA tests. Uh, the time duration factor measures how efficiently the user can control the wheelchair, and the null hypothesis assumes that there is no significant difference between the mean value of the times to finish the pre-evaluation and the mean values of the time to finish the post-evaluation. However, we can prove that there is a statistically significant difference between the two. As calculated, uh, the p-value was equal to 0 0.003, which is less than 0 0.05, meaning there is a statistically significant difference in the time duration to complete the task before the VR training and after the VR training. 
the mean finishing time for the pre-evaluation was 89.9 seconds, and the mean finishing time for the post-evaluation was 67.13 seconds. Uh, therefore, we are able to reject the null hypothesis. For the bottle collisions suggested, suggest there is no significant difference between the mean value of the number of bottle collisions during the pre-evaluation and the mean value of the number of bottle collisions during the post-evaluation. The mean number of bottle collisions for the pre-evaluation was 4.13, and the mean number of bottle collisions for the post-evaluation was 1.6, and the calculated p-value was 0 0.0035, which is less than 0 0.05, uh, meaning there was a statistically significant difference in the number of bottles knocked over. So we can, we can conclude that both the proficiency and the precision of the wheelchair control reject the null hypothesis and strongly validate our VR training effects. So after the users completed the training, they were given a survey to complete to see what they thought of the training. Most users had a positive experience with the training simulation and found that it indeed was effective, enjoyable, comfortable, and so on. Uh, for future works, adding a control group and introducing penalty reward mechanisms to increase the level of entertainment are things we may look into. Also, expanding the size of the environments to a whole house instead of a simple room and attempting to simulate outdoor environments would be something also to look into. So thank you for listening. Hello, uh, thank you, Javier. Is there any uh, question about this paper you may ask on Slido? Uh, maybe I can ask a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I want to know how really realistic is the virtual uh, wheelchair setup compared to a real wheelchair mm -hmm. experience like uh, how about the, like the haptic feeling provided by your setup is it pretty similar to uh, what a person may experience on the real wheelchair um, I think it's relatively close I uh, we definitely need to look a little more into providing um, a little more resistance when actually turning the wheelchairs because when we had them raised um, compared to if you were actually be to be moving around with a real wheelchair, um, you wouldn't, the amount of resistance would be different, obviously, because you're on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we look back at the user reviews, the majority of the uh, users thought that it was uh, relatively realistic. So I think obviously we, we can probably um, focus a little more on making the haptic feeling seem more like a, an actual wheelchair, but I think we got it pretty close. Cool. Yep. Uh, let me see. I don't see any other questions uh, on Slido. So I think we are, we are done with this presentation. Thank you, Javier. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Our next paper is titled Real-Time VR Simulation of Laparoscopic Cholestatomy Based on Parallel Position-Based Dynamics in GPU. The authors are Jinjin Pan from Beihan University, Lei Yu Zhan from Beihan University, Pan Yu from Beihan University, uh, Yan Shen from Beijing Lomo University, Haipen Wang from Beijing Aeros Aerospace General Hospital, and I Min Hao from Beihan University, and Hong Qin from Stony Brook University. The presenter is uh, Pan Yu, I believe. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Yeah, Pan Yu. Okay, go ahead. I pass you the time. This is Peng Yu. I come from Beihan University in China. I'm glad to present our paper today. So here we go. Everyone, it is a great honor to make a presentation at this conference today. Yes, we the use the pre-recorded uh, video. So VR can we of laparoscopic uh, play the video based now? Parallel position -based I believe so. I believe we can play the recorded video the and uh, lab of VR technology you will be and here during the Q&A section in case Beijing uh, Aerospace uh, General uh, Hospital, uh, yeah, Stony Brook good. University and Beijing Normal University. This is the content we talk about today. Okay, okay, cool. So let's let's do it. In recent years, virtual reality oh, VR, okay. Okay, based training has greatly changed yeah. surgeons learning mode it can simulate the surgery from the visual auditory and tactile aspects vr medical simulator can greatly reduce the risk of the real patient and the mm -hmm. cost of hospitals laparoscopic cholecystectomy is one of the typical representatives in minimal invasive surgery miss due to the large incidence of cholecystectomy the application of its VR-based simulation is vital and necessary for the resident's surgical training. In this paper, we present a VR simulation framework based on position-based <laughs> dynamics Sorry. EBD, for cholecystectomy. We investigate a number of soft tissue deformation methods, such as FEM, mass spring model, and PBD. We also study the simulation of electrocautery. Uh, is everything Our research aim is okay? to accelerate the deformation of soft tissue on GPU okay. and improve the realism yes. of fat tissue burning. The contributions oh, no, consist of a deformation model of soft tissue based on so, graph coloring parallel Andrew, acceleration like to within show position based the dynamics, video? PVD. Okay, uh, well, a biothermal then, then the, then like Pan Yu and Jin Jin and a hybrid multi model connection, see method, the video? which can simulate okay. the separation of the gallbladder from liver yeah, in yeah. real time. Then they know where, where, where the presentation this is. The is. software architecture of our developed simulation system. It includes two phases offline and online. The offline phase consists of loading the geometric model, initializing the physical model creating stretching constraints and volume constraints, and coloring the physical model using the graph algorithm. For the online phase, the system first detects collision based on the data sent by the force feedback device, then calculates the potential distribution of the model and solves the constraints yeah, yes, in parallel yes, yes. for the soft tissue deformation, and finally updates the model texture and shape in a graphic and tactile manner. The parallel PVD on graph coloring in our paper is described as algorithm 1. For graph coloring, line 2 in algorithm 1, we implement coloring partition based on the random dying disk graph coloring algorithm. The constraints are solved on GPU. Figure 3 shows the graph coloring of distance constraints. Each edge in the tetrahedron is a distance constraint, which can be treated as node, the blue point, in graph, B, is abstracting the constraints with a shared vertex into two nodes, which are connected by an indirect edge. Two connected indirect edges denote these constraints having a shared vertex, hence they should be assigned with different color. This figure shows the results of graph coloring for the distance constraints and volume constraints. For the simulation of electrocautery, we focus on how to convert the heat into the potential distribution on the surface of soft tissue. 
we intend to update the temperature distribution of models based on the bioheat transfer equation. The surface bioheat transfer equation can be expressed as this equation. This figure illustrates the simulation of fat tissue burning process. The red point P1 indicates that its potential has reached the threshold T, boiling point. Consequently, the tetrahedron is in the heated state, blue edges, but the length is unchanged. P1 and P2 reach the boiling point, then the tetrahedron begins to burn. The red edge indicates that it is burning and the volume of the tetrahedron begins to decrease. P1, P2, and P3 reach the boiling point. Once the four vertices of the tetrahedron are at the boiling point state, the tetrahedron will be deleted. This shows the topology change of fat tissue mesh before and after electrocautery. Now let's see the experiments and comparison. This is four simulation videos of fat tissue electrocautery. This is four simulation videos of gallbladder and liver separation. This is the percentage of computational cost for each task during offline and online phases. The most time-consuming task in offline phase is the tetrahedron initialization, which takes about 2,886 milliseconds. The most time-consuming task in online phase is the parallel PBD deformation, which takes about 16.5 milliseconds. We also compare our graph coloring method with other approaches and in different models. We can see that random coloring disk algorithm is the most efficient method. This is the visual performance of different graph coloring methods. The left three columns are the coloring of distance constraints of different coloring algorithms. The right three columns are the coloring of volume constraints of different coloring algorithms. This is the comparison of parallel PBD and ordinary PBD simulation results for gallbladder model. The implementation of the coloring algorithm on the GPU can be 1.2 to 5 times faster than the algorithm on the CPU. We can find that this algorithm has a great advantage for real-time simulation. However, the improvement of performance using our dying algorithm is not as high as we expected. The main reason is that different groups of constraints are solved serially. The second reason is that the number of constraints for each color is not in good balance. It increases the calculation cost. This is the comparison of data size and computational efficiency with respect to the work of Kim. Our method is 3 to 8 times faster than his method. Our computation costs are significantly lower than it. And the advantage of our method is obvious when simulating complex models. This is the comparison of simulation visual performance with the work of Kim. We use dynamic texture techniques to render the process of stripping the gallbladder from the liver. During electrocautery with the L-hook, the liver surface will leave burning traces, which enhance the visual realism. Finally, we invited 32 surgeons from Beijing Aerospace General Hospital to test and evaluate our simulator. All participants were asked to complete a survey to give us feedback. 82% think that we should apply the laparoscopic surgery simulator to the daily medical education. This is conclusion of our work. We used the random dying disk algorithm implemented on GPU to accelerate the deformation model and obtain a better computation performance. We also introduced a physical model based on bioheat conduction in the fat tissue electrocautery. Our simulator can separate the liver and gallbladder with a hybrid multi-model connection model. Nevertheless, there are certain limitations in our simulation. Due to the intrinsic shortcoming of PBD method, 
the stiffness of the organ model is sensitive to the number of iterations and the step size. But it could be eliminated with extended position-based dynamics, XPBD, which can be employed in our simulator in the near future. At present, Phantom Omni only supports single point force feedback, a trainee can merely grab a point or a few points in local area when grabbing the soft tissue. To achieve more realistic results, we need to improve the haptic device to achieve multi-point contact. Moreover, we can develop the evaluation system, which can afford a reminder when operation error happens and deliver the score report after the training is completed. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, so thanks for the presentation. Uh, does anyone have any question? You may type in the Slido and I will pick the questions up. So maybe I can ask a question. Uh, I yes. think this is a wonderful work and thank you for the presentation. Uh, do you have any ideas how you may uh, apply your uh, simulation model for simulating other other everyone. Uh, medical operations? Yeah, for now, uh, we just uh, apply our simulation in this uh, specific surgery, mm -hmm. but our simulation method can also apply uh, into other kind of surgery. Uh, mm. The simulation about deformation and uh, burning um, is uh, is a common method. So yep. um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I will give some more information about it. Uh, because currently, uh, this uh, paper is about the cholecystomy simulation. But in fact, our simulator our simulator have been uh, applied. Uh, to the the simulation of the, the bowel cancer uh, mm -hmm. surgery and also some uh, uh, um, stomach, you know, losing weight. You, we should give a band and a stomach to losing weight, such as these operations yep. uh, uh, in the in the abdominal cavity. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. So. I don't see any qu other questions on Slido. So maybe we can thank the authors again and move on to the next paper. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so our third paper in this session is titled A Physics-Based Virtual Reality Simulation Framework for Leonardo Leto and the Intubation. The paper offers are Xiao Xiao from George Washington University, Shen Zhao from George Washington University, Yan Man from George Washington University, Lamia So here from Children's National Health Systems, Xiao Ke Zhen from George Washington University, and James Han from George Washington University. And 
I think the authors will show their pre-recorded video. Um, and Xiao Xiao, who is one of the authors, uh, is here to answer the questions during the uh, Q&A. Okay, Hello, everyone. So we can play My the pre-recorded presentation to first. And present our work. This okay. is a joint work of the George Washington University and the National Children's Health Systems. Neonatal endotracheal intubation is a time-sensitive resuscitation procedure essential for ventilation of newborns. It requires an unusually high level of skills due yeah, to I'm narrow streaming hours, right now. relatively large tongue, anterior glottic position, and no respiratory reserve of neolates. Okay. The procedure can be briefly summarized mm -hmm. as using a neuroscope to manipulate the tongue and the epiglottis to get a clear view of the vocal cords and then insert a tube into the trachea. Typical training methods for this procedure include uh, participating in neonatal uh, resuscitation training programs, intubating newborns under supervision, and practicing um, mannequin-based task trainers. However, the intubation uh, success rates for pediatric residents exposed to those techniques are known and show little change between first and third year of residency. Also, each resident experiences an average of only three clinical opportunities during three years of residency. Using no fidelity, mannequins allow learners to achieve some level of competence prior to clinical exposure. However, they suffer from uh, issues such as providing little variation in anatomy and difficulty level, lacking physical realism, and having poor visualization of the events occurring within the mannequin. In order to address the concerns of previous training methods, a few computer-based training systems have been developed, such as the Virtual Airway Skills Trainer and the Airway VR Trainer. Both of them provide realistic, immersive virtual environments and allow early learning for medical students. However, they are not capable of uh, simulating the entire procedure in a realistic manner. In VAST, only two tasks prior to the procedure instead of the actual intubation are simulated. In our way, VR, even though it's capable of simulating the entire procedure, however, the virtual model only allows limited interactions such as head elevation and jaw opening. Both soft tissue deformation and two tissue collision detections are not implemented, which are essential for realistic simulation. The instruments are controlled by hand controllers, which is not intuitive and does not offer realistic force feedback. In contrast to previous VR systems, our simulation framework addresses all the aforementioned issues by offering a fully interactive and configurable immersive virtual environment where both visual and physical realism are achieved. In our system, the user interacts with the virtual objects through the sensors. The haptic device and the electromagnetic sensor allow by manual interaction with the virtual neuroscope and the endotracheal tube. The hand controller is used to adjust the various parameters in a VR simulator, such as head elevation, jaw opening, and oral suction. The simulation engine contains two simulation layers. The position-based dynamics layer models the behavior of human body constituents, such as soft tissues, bones, and fluids in a unified particle representation. In parallel, an independent rigid body dynamics layer is in integrated to provide additional functionalities such as joints for virtual coupling of the instruments. Each object has multiple representations for modeling, collision detection, and visualization. At each time stamp, the updated states of the objects are visually and haptically rendered in separate threads. The kinematic data and the collision information are also passed to the enhanced visualization component for computation of real-time visual feedback, such as the color-coded force on the upper gums, line of sight through the blade, and the percentage of glottis opening. 
The virtual model is reconstructed from CT scans of a real neonatal patient acquired from National Children's Hospital. For simplicity, we segmented the model into three parts, body tissue, tongue, and bone. We, sep uh, we separated the tongue from the body tissue to allow for varying the size of the tongue or changing the tongue model to simulate different levels of difficulty. The final segmentation results are exported into surface meshes, which are further smoothed and simplified. In order to simulate the motion of patient's head and mandible, an articulated skeletal structure was developed. The oral, laryngeal, and pharyngeal axes are superimposed on the model to help the user get the optimal head position before the procedure. The haptic rendering process is separated from the physical thread to ensure a smooth haptic update rate at about 1000 Hz. We used the two different approaches for computing the force responses. For the force feedback with rigid body, we employed a virtual spring damper control between the haptic interface position and the proxy position. For the force feedback with soft body, the force is calculated as the average displacement of contacted particles with the instrument from their resting positions. The summation of the forces due to interactions with rich bodies and soft tissues is sent back to the haptic device for force feedback. To quantify the relative realism of the VR simulator compared to a medicine-based simulator, we conducted a concurrent validation study. Fifteen experts were recruited at National Children's Hospital. Each subject performed ETI on both the medicine-based AR system and the VR system. The AR system is previously developed in our lab, which includes a standard four-term task trainer mannequin, a naringoscope, and an endotracheal tube, which are registered to their virtual CT scan counterparts. The motion of the neuroscope and the mannequin are captured by the electromagnetic sensors. Four conditions were tested for each subject using a crossover design. In condition two, we adjusted the virtual patient size to be the same as the mannequin in condition one in the AR system. In condition three, the virtual patient was configured to a smaller primordial infant size with relatively larger tongue and a smaller jaw opening. The saliva simulation was turned on. A smaller blade and a thinner endotracheal tube were used. In condition 4, the virtual patient had the same configurations as the one in condition 2, but with four suite of enhanced visualization tools. A questionnaire with 17 items was administered immediately following the completion of certain conditions. The questions are grouped into realism of anatomy, soft tissue and haptic feedback, motion consistency of tools, different, uh, difficulty of level change, and helpfulness of enhanced visualization tools. After the trials, an expert instructor viewed the 3D playback of motions and rated the performances under the four conditions using the enhanced visualization tools for, for both systems. In an AR system, the instructor viewed the 3D playback of the motions of the CT scanned virtual counterparts displayed on the computer screen. The motions can be uh, viewed from any viewpoint. In a VR system, the instructor can view the 3D playback through the HMD from any viewpoint or look at the computer screen, which provides left eye view from the HMD cross-sectional view and the video neuroscopic uh, scopic view. Enhanced visualization tools such as the color-coded force on the upper gums, percentage of the glottis opening, and the trajectory of the neuroscope are shown to provide instructors with a complete visualization for performance assessment. In addition, the computer system has extracted eight performance parameters from the AR system and additional four more, uh, four more parameters from the VR system. Those parameters are recorded throughout each trial. Here are the results of the questionnaire. Subjects have rated significantly in favor of the VR simulator with respect to the realism of the anatomy and the soft tissue. 
In addition, though not significant, the fear of the mannequin and the VR patient are on average better for the VR simulator. For the motion consistency of virtual tours in a uh, VR simulator, subjects give an average score of 4 for the neuroscope and 3.2 for the endotracheal tube. The relatively lower ratings on questions 6 to 8 are associated with the hardware limitation limitations of the haptic device and the electromagnetic sensor. The difficulty of condition 3 has been rated much harder compared to condition 2, with an average score of 4.2. The realism of saliva received an average score of 3.7. Even though not strongly positive, all the subjects stated that the simulation of saliva successfully prevented them from getting a clear view of the vocal cords. Uh, the only concern here is the subjects suggested that the saliva should have a foamier appearance. Those results indicate that the VR simulator has the ability to simulate different levels of difficulty, which is one of the important advantages over mannequin-based simulators. All the questions regarding the enhanced visualization tools received average score above 4, which indicate that our visualization tools are helpful in guiding subjects during the procedure. Here are the results of the reader's scores for the four conditions. The average score on the VR for condition 2 is higher than that on the mannequin. With increased level of difficulty in condition 3, the average score is lower than that in condition 2. In condition 4, with enhanced visualization, the average score is slightly higher compared to that in condition 2. However, the differences did not uh, reach statistical significance. With respect to subjects' performance parameters in condition 1 and 2, the average force on gum and the pitch rocking are both significantly lower on the VR than those on the mannequin which indicates subjects performed better ATI on the VR patient than on the mannequin. There is no uh, significant difference on the rest of the parameters except the time, which is significantly longer on the VR than on the mannequin. This can probably be explained by the fact that all, all the subjects had experience with mannequin-based simulators, but only one of them had experience with VR simulators and none with video games. In condition 3, with increased level of difficulty, there are significant increases in pitch peaks and pitch rocking, which indicate that increasing the difficulty level caused more up and down repositions of the blade with a larger angular displacement. Moreover, the subjects had more attempts and spent longer time with increased level of difficulty. The maximum and mean depths in condition 3 are both significantly smaller than that in condition 2, which is because the virtual model is a smaller primordial infant. In condition 4 with enhanced visualization, the maximum force on gum, the your peaks, your rocking, and the time are all significantly lower than that in condition 2. Though not, sing uh, though not statistically significant, the percentages of glottis opening are on, are on average higher in condition 4 with enhanced visualization, and the head angles are on average closer to the optimal angle in condition 4, which indicate our enhanced visualization tools are helpful in guiding trainees during the procedure. So in conclusion, we have presented a practical and efficient simulation framework that offers a completely new training platform with realistic and configurable immersive virtual environments. Our simulation framework is able to simulate complex scenarios with rigid bones, soft tissues, and fluids in a unified particle representation using stable and efficient PBD method in real time. Results from the validation study indicate the anatomy and the soft tissue in our VR simulator are more realistic than the mannequin-based simulator. More importantly, our VR simulator is capable of simulating varying levels of difficulty, uh, capturing all motions, and uh, giving a complete visualization of the procedure. 
making the approach a promising platform for medical simulation and training. Thank you for your attention. I'm now happy to. Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I got one question from the audience uh, from Pablo. So Pablo said, thanks for your talk. Did you have limitations of movements from the haptic device that could affect the realism of the procedure with Leolatos? So we have Xiao Xiao here, who is one of the authors to answer. Um, okay, yeah, um, there are um, in, in, in total like uh, three major limitations of the uh, haptic device. The first is that uh, the haptic device has a uh, limited volume of its uh, workspace. However, uh, the, uh, the works, uh, volume of the workspace is um, sufficient to cover the volume of the motions for this uh, ETI procedure. And another limitation is that uh, it has uh, only three um, degrees of freedom uh, force output. Output it lacks um, um, the torque output from the uh, rotational movement. And um, the third limitation is that the haptic uh, device has a maximum force output. Yeah, that's the uh, three limitations from the haptic device. Thank you, Xiao Xiao, and. Any other questions you may pose on Slido? Looks like there's no other questions. So let's thank Xiao Xiao again for the presentation. And we move on to the next paper. Okay, so the next paper in our session is titled Analyzing Usability and Presence of a Virtual Reality Operating Room Simulator During Laparoscopic Surgery Training. The authors are Man Li from Delft University of Technology and Xi'an Xiao Tong University, Sandeep Gani from Delft University of Technology and Medical College. Jiroren Ponten from Katharina Hospital. Amagen Albergwerk from Delft University of Technology. Annie Frankos Wukowski from Tiburg University. Jack. Joachim Morgwitz from Delft University of Technology. And the authors will play the pre-recorded uh, videos. And if you have questions, you may ask during the Q&A session. Good morning, everyone. This is Meng Li from Delft University of Technology. Uh, now I'm going presenting a collaborative project between TU Delft uh, Katharina Hospital and Tilburg University. This, is, this study evaluated usability and presence of a virtuality operating room simulator during a laparoscopic surgery training. As we know, laparoscopic surgery received a lot of uh, attention recently due to their benefit uh, versus open surgery. For example, less pain and bleeding, shorter hospital stay, and quicker recovery. 
they are also one of the uh, most uh, developing field of the surgery area. For example, the cholecystectomy is now uh, as a demand uh, as a standard procedure, and the robotic surgery is the most of the advancing field of the laparoscopic surgery. The laparoscopic surgery requires different skills than the open surgery. For example, they are uh, operated under restricted hand movements, narrow field of view, non-intuitive hand-eye coordination, and ever-changing instrument. Within the uh, operating room, there are different kinds of distractions, so uh, the surgeons also need self-management throughout the procedure. Thanks to the introduction of uh, virtuality surgical simulators, the surgeons are able to improve uh, laparoscopic skills without subjecting the patients to unnecessary skill or pain. We can see there is a trend of this kind of VR training from um, psychomotor skills to procedure skills and to training within the full context of the OR. There is another trend shows on top of this image is from non-immersive application to highly immersive application. I can see my instruments um, in front of me. And I can see my assisting nurse to my left. I can see my assistant on the right. I can see my uh, anesthetist sitting behind me. Now I'm going to see my pedals in place. I'm going to select my instrument using the tool. And I also get a feedback from my nurse uh, confirming the instrument I've just selected. Okay, select a molecular hook. The VR setup we applied uh, comprised three components in this study a VR laparoscopic simulator a VR headset and a virtual OR environment. It is because the main drawback of current VR laparoscopic simulator is lack of true representation of the operating theater experience. The most uh, VR laparoscopic simulator uses a 2D display that replicates the tasks, but not the busy and chaotic environment. And in this study, we simulated uh, different kinds of distractions. For example, uh, there are three most uh, often occurring distractions, such as door open, um, radio, and uh, phone calling. And as well as one most distracting one is um, case-related communication. Other studies have reviewed the face validity and the user's preference of immersive VR laparoscopic simulators, but how intuitively and professionally user can utilize a virtual OR simulator to achieve their objectives is still unknown. Therefore, the focus of this study is to investigate usability and presence to identify the potential benefit and improvement opportunities of the virtual operating room. So uh, we are evaluate these factors uh, from three aspects of ergonomics. In this study, we using presence questionnaire, localized procedure, uh, this discomfort form, uh, questionnaire for intuitive use and NASA TLX to identify the physical and cognitive ergonomics. And for the organizational ergonomics, we are using interviews.
invited 29 uh, surgical trainings and eight uh, surgeons to participate in this study. Um, in this study, we referred the surgical trainings as novice and surgeons as expert. Among our participants, there are 12 persons had experience on VR or AR technologies. We told the participant the purpose of this study is to investigate the use of VOR in a surgical training. And then they need to uh, uh, complete a hand-on task in VOR and in 50 minutes. If they cannot finish this in this time duration, uh, they can stop because the focus of this study is not on their performance. From the result of usability, we find out that the VOR appeared intuitive and satisfying to perform laparoscopic procedure training. For example, for intuitive use, um, the achievement of goals are perceived at high and the error rate are, are low. Both of them are related with uh, uh, in effective uh, interaction and the effort of learning is low and it is associated with the uh, previous knowledge for the first time of use. Um, the mental load uh, level are moderate, uh, among which the mental demand and effort are the most uh, uh, influential factors for both expert and the novice and the frustration are the lowest level. Um, the differences between the novice and the expert is that they have a higher hey. mental demand Hello. effort, uh, physical demand hey, hey. and uh, temporary demand than the, the expert. Localized the postural discomfort, we can see that the participant only experienced uh, this very uh, little discomfort on seven body segments. Hey, hello. Hey. Like this. <laughs> and hey. for the unsupported discomfort, we categorize the rate for more than two points according to ISO standard. And we find out the left hand, the neck, and the both eyes uh, are experienced this kind of discomfort. You can see that the self-evaluation of performance is the most important factors for a higher perf uh, presence of VOR, which are including uh, how quickly the users can adjust to the experience and how efficient in moving and uh, interacting by the end of this experience. And for the least uh, contributed factors are the quality of interface. Uh, among them, the visual display quality and the handhold of the simulator are rated at the lowest for all the participants. In interviews, we can aggregate general feedbacks about the VOR. Most participants perceive themselves as physically presented in a real OR and they are highly engaged throughout the procedure. Talks and sounds uh, enhanced their experience of the presence and especially for the trainees, they were excited to complete the task. Improving user interface is the main demand of the uh, VOR improvement. We can see that uh, the participant with the uh, corrected uh, vision either have the problem have, uh, to see a clear image or have the difficulties to put on the VR headset on top of their glasses. And sometimes the headset can even press on the glasses and cause pain. Uh, and also the low graphic re uh, resolution is reported. And for the tour car, and for the um, haptic feedback, the most important uh, problem is uh, the low haptic resistance and the delay in changing instrument. Our environment is critical to increase uh, presence. Uh, for the VR setup, um, 
most participants notice uh, the, the, their body part, for example, their feet are missing within the VOR. And the incorrect OR layout, this uh, proportionate element and unrealistic uh, rendering also cause the unrealistic uh, experience. And for the surgery steps, um, they have in real OR uh, different, slightly differences, but the steps in the VOR seem to be more rigid. Is expected. Many participants noticed that the virtue instructor repeated the task they have already performed. It makes them feel confusing. And in the real OR, an assistant will follow the surgeon's movement to change the camera, but this part is missing in the VOR. And for the mood aspect, the communication was impersonal and needs some need add some emotion. And the team was also motionless and in the reality, the team could usually move around even if it's just slight. The last one is the needs for personalization. Um, for example, um, some participant ignore the instruction because they find another person's name was called. And uh, usually, some participants expect to communicate with their own native language. We can see that the sound and the language part is the important aspect for personalization. The results of this study, we learned advantages and improvements of the VOR. The immersive training via VR headset heightens the motivation of the trainees. Um, the VR surgical training demonstrated good sense of uh, usability and presence. The increased mental workload uh, creates a beneficial condition for novice perform better in a real-world environment. There are four improvements found in the study. User interface improvements are the most uh, civilian uh, uh, requirement and more realistic uh, environmental setup via panoramic and volumetric uh, videos. Immersive team interaction will mimic uh, mental distractions and enrich experience via personalization. Three limitations of our study. We uh, avoid comparing the VOR with either regular VR laparoscopic simulator or real uh, surgery. Secondly, that uh, current study just applied the self-assessment of performance, but we will incorporate uh, the objective uh, assessment in the future study. And besides that, uh, the different type of uh, distractions will also be compared in the future study. In general, VOR demonstrated a new dimension in providing immersive training during a laparoscopic simulation, and four improvements uh, mentioned above would increase the effectiveness of the VOR and boost the motivation and speed up the process of adaptation of the trainees as well.
thank you for the presentation. Uh, one of the authors, Man Li, is here uh, on Zoom. And I've got two questions from the audience. So the first question is, at onset of presentation, door closing was mentioned. Can you clarify how the door closing affects the use of the VOR simulator? Yeah, Mandy, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I I uh, am standing this question. So the uh, the question is uh, means that uh, how uh, can I qualify the effect of the door opening event uh, to affect the use of uh, the OR simulator, right? Correct. Hello, everyone. My name is Tanbir Irfan Choudhury. Yes. Um, well, the. Uh, the idea is that uh, for this study, we are doing a uh, preliminary testing. So um, this door opening event will uh, uh, happening randomly throughout the procedure. So we uh, we don't uh, specifically calculate that uh, uh, what is the effect uh, of this uh, of this event before and after uh, of the uh, evaluate of this uh, uh, of this uh, uh, situation. So what uh, our goal is to establish in general, um, what are the usability and the presence of these uh, uh, virtual operating room simulation uh, at the first step. I think it's a good suggestion. And I also mentioned in my limitation that we will uh, do a further study on uh, different kinds of uh, distractions. For example, the door opening uh, effect on the uh, simulation and also on the presence. Thank you, Man. And we have another question from mm -hmm. uh, uh, Anderson. So his question is, in real laparoscopy, a high resolution screen is used. How do you think the use of a HMD affect the visual accuracy of the anatomy and instruments? Mm -hmm in the rather small virtual video screen, and how this affect uh, usability and task performance? Oh, yeah, yeah, that is a very good question, actually. Um, yeah, a, a lot of participants noticed that uh, um, the uh, video re uh, resolution uh, was not high enough uh, throughout uh, this uh, procedure. So that is also one of uh, my main points for the limitation of the current uh, version that uh, they say that um, the visual uh, the visual interface also the haptic interface it means that uh, the haptic residence a resort resistance of these uh, um, with, with these instruments are the most um, um, important factors to improve the usability but also the uh, presence okay thank you one again yeah. and I think that's all the questions I've got. And okay. uh, thank you for the presentation and the Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to the next paper. OK. Our next paper in the session is titled VR Disability Simulation Reduces Implicit Bias Towards Persons with Disabilities. The authors are Tanvir Chauhari from University of Texas, Sharif Mohammed Shanurs of Ferdos from University of Texas, and John Corls from University of Texas. The authors will uh, have prepared a video of their presentation. So we will play the video now. From Marshall University, West Virginia, USA. Today, I'm going to present our work, Virtual Reality Disability Simulation 
reduces implicit bias towards persons with disabilities. This work was published in IEEE TVC Journal in December 2019. My co-authors are Dr. Shanaj Ferdos from the College of New Jersey and Dr. John Qualls from University of Texas, San Antonio. This research is an extension of our previous work titled Information Recall in a Virtual Reality Disability Simulation, which was published in SEM VRST 2017. The previous work was mostly focused on in which condition, immersive versus non-immersive, the participants can recall information they learn in the virtual environment better. We also investigated how feeling present in virtual environment affects their information recall task. The current research, however, focused on how experiencing disability simulation in different conditions, again, immersive versus non-immersive, can influence the participants' bias towards people with disabilities. According to Flower et al., disability simulation is an approach to modify attitudes towards people with disabilities. In a disability simulation, people without disabilities are placed in a situations that are designed for them to experience what it is like to have a disability. Several approaches have been implemented to promote more positive attitudes towards people with disabilities. For example, showing films presenting a positive image, educating people using accurate information, interaction between individuals with and without disabilities in an equal status relationship, etc. However, the categories of disability simulation strategies have sometimes been criticized for reported lack of evidence of their effectiveness. Despite the criticism, disability simulation remains a common approach to attempt positive modifications of attitudes regarding people with disabilities. What is an attitude? An attitude is our evaluation of some concepts, for example, person, place, idea, etc. There are two types of attitudes, explicit and implicit. An explicit attitude is the kind of attitude that we deliberately think about and report. For example, you could tell someone whether you like mathematics or not. Implicit attitudes are positive and negative evaluations that are much less accessible to our conscious mind. Even if you say that you like mathematics, it is possible that you associate math with negativity without being actively aware about it. In this case, we could say that your implicit attitude towards math is negative. Virtual reality has been used to change implicit bias in various researches. For example, it's been shown that embodying a black avatar reduces implicit racial bias. It has also been shown that such an effect lasts at least one week after the end of the exposure. Multiple sclerosis is an unpredictable often disabling central nervous system disease that disrupts the flow of information within the brain and between the brain and body. Each year, people with multiple sclerosis gather in different places and participate in an annual fundraising work. They call it MS work. One of the such places is happened to be the A20 Center in San Antonio, Texas, USA, which motivates us to conduct user studies simulating walking or gait problem of people associated with multiple sclerosis. We used Unity 3D, a multi-platform game engine, to design the disability simulation. The environment is a virtual model of a 20 center. The task for the participants was to navigate a path and listen to the audio information about multiple sclerosis in various places indicated by the information board shown in the bottom picture. The camera was in first-person view mode. We have used two types of navigational interface in our user study, a gamepad and a physical wheelchair. Unity has built-in support for gamepad input. All we had to do was capture the input and translate it into the movement of avatar in the virtual environment. For the wheelchair interface, we created a server client-like setup in our application. The wheelchair was mounted on top of two bike trainers and two Android phones were connected to the wheels of the chair. Our disability simulation Unity application acted as a server and the two Android phones 
acted as two clients who sent rotational data of the corresponding wheel continuously. To move forward, the participant had to rotate both of the wheels forward. To take a left turn, the participant must rotate the right wheel and stop the left wheel. If she rotated the left wheel and stop the right wheel, a right turn would happen. Multiple Sclerosis Questionnaire was used to evaluate information recall task. We developed this questionnaire using the information obtained from the National Multiple Sclerosis website. Presence Involvement Flow Framework Questionnaire is a standard questionnaire commonly used to evaluate presence, involvement and flow in video games. We are mostly interested in presence and involvement. Involvement is how much attention or focus you give to the virtual environment. Simulator Sickness Questionnaire is a standard questionnaire commonly used to evaluate experience of cyber sickness symptoms in virtual reality. The Implicit Association Test or IAT measures the attitude and beliefs that people may be unwilling or unable to report. We have used Disability Implicit Association Test in our user study. The figure shows the list of words and pictures used in the IAT in our user study. Here is how an IAT is conducted. The screen is divided into two sides, labeled on the top. Here the category disabled person is grouped with good and the category abled person is grouped with bad. When a word or picture from the previous slide comes in the middle, the participants had to press E or I to categorize them as left group or the right group. Here is the same task but the label on the top is changed. The implicit association test looks at the reaction time of the participant. Based on the reaction time, it calculates a score that represents the participant's preference towards the concept. This is the interpretation of the IAT score. More positive score means preference to the abled person and negative score means preference to the persons with disability. We, however, mostly interested in the delta score, meaning the change in bias after experiencing the virtual reality disability simulation. Now let's talk about the user study. One of the independent variable in our user study is display type. Two types of display were used in the user study, immersive Oculus HMD and non-immersive desktop monitor. Second independent variable in our user study was navigation interface. Two types of navigational interface were used in our user study, a wheelchair and the gamepad. Combining the display and the navigation interface, we had 2x2 two two between subject design. The four condition of our user studies are desktop with wheelchair, oculus with wheelchair, desktop with gamepad and Oculus with the gamepad. We had a total of seven hypotheses for this study. Many of them were similar to the previous work that was accepted in VRST 2017. Those hypotheses further validates our previous work. While I am not going to discuss all the hypotheses related to the validation of previous study result, I encourage you to read them in the paper. The most important hypothesis from this study is the sense of presence in our disability simulation will have an effect on the level of implicit association of people without disabilities towards people with disabilities. We recruited 71 undergraduate students. 28 of them were female. Mean age was about 21 years. 11 participants had prior experience with virtual reality. Again. Our study was a 2 by 2 between subject design with these four conditions. The user study consists of seven steps. Step 1. The participants had to fill up an ethics board approved consent form. Step 2. They were given a brief introduction about the system and were told what they are expected to do in the study. Step 3. They fill up a simulator sickness questionnaire. Step 4. 
they took their first visibility implicit association test. Step 5, VR experience in random condition. Step 6, they took the second disability IAT. Step 7, fill up the SSQ, MSQ and PIF questionnaires. Let's talk about the Delta IIT score result for the display group. Main effects analysis showed that the change in bias towards people with disability was greater for participants who were in immersive Oculus HMD condition than the participant in non-immersive desktop condition. However, the high variance in desktop condition indicates that Hello. a prediction of Delta IIT score for someone in this condition has far greater uncertainty attached to it than a prediction for the oculus condition where <laughs> it would be a safe bet that the delta it score would be doesn't negative. work with the audio <laughs> Again, the negative delta it score means higher oh no, maybe I can't. for the people with disability Hello. yes i think the audio looking at the delta it score result for navigation interface group main effect analysis showed that the change in bias towards people with disability was greater for participants who were in I, wheelchair interface I, condition then the participants hello in the gamepad <laughs> interface that doesn't work do you hear me <laughs> again the high variance of gamepad condition indicates that a prediction of delta it for yes, someone I in this condition you. has it's far greater my... uncertainty attached to it than can a you prediction hear me? for a wheelchair condition where yes but i have to unmute my microphone from time to time it is good maybe Same you're doing that right <laughs> okay based on the result we can accept our hypothesis that states, the sense of presence in our disability simulation will have an effect on the level of implicit association of people without disabilities towards people with disabilities. There are a couple of reasons that explains our finding. First, we believe the higher sense of presence and the unique experience that the immersive conditions in our disability simulation provides to the participants was one of the main contributing factors for the higher change in bias towards people with disabilities. In addition, our finding is also aligned with the previous research that suggests educating people without disabilities about people with disabilities using accurate information is one of the way to promote more positive attitudes towards people with disabilities. To the best of our knowledge, this study was the first attempt to investigate implicit association towards people with disability in a VR disability simulation. However, we need to treat the interpretation of IAT with caution. The IAT score should not be used as an indicator of prejudice against people with disabilities. Instead, IAT score feedback should be used as an educational device to raise awareness about the implicit bias and how it may affect one's interaction with others. We believe more research is needed to investigate this further. Again, my name is Thanvi Irfan Choudhury and I can be reached at this email. If you have any query, please don't hesitate to shoot an email to me. I will be very happy to reply to you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And the authors are not able to join us on the Zoom room. So if you have any question, you may email the authors directly. And we have all the papers in our section presented. So I think, yeah, we are done. So thank you for attending this section. Thank you.